You're listening to Let Me Tell You Why You're Wrong, all on Georgia Radio Network. From the All on Georgia Caribbean Command, just outside of Rajasthan, Aruba, this is the Let Me Tell You Why You're Wrong podcast. I'm Dave Roberts. From the Georgia Command Center, she is journalist, TV personality, and has a snazzy pink reflective vest, Jessica Salaji. Do you plan the introductions or do you wing it? I wing it for the most part. Lucky us. <laughs> Should I plan? <laughs> no, I just I just wonder like if you're you drag out the delivery of the of each thing so that you can think about what to add next. <laughs> you know, I got enough people says <laughs> critiquing my delivery <laughs> and you to do it on air. <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> Jessica, besides being ant food, how are you doing? Oh, everything's fine other than being ant food, but it's that time of year. Plus, it's been raining nonstop, and so there's just massive ant hills everywhere. Like, every all over the deck, they're coming for high ground. It's just miserable. I'm ready, I'm ready for everything to be iced out and die. All those little creatures. Just die. <laughs> Let it go. Let mm-hmm. it go. Let it so... Burn. <laughs> Let it burn. <laughs> so as we record this, uh, we're in the middle of a monsoon. The lawn chemical company comes out, and I've got them on video today, in rain. I, I don't know how many inches of rain we got today, and sprayed the lawn in a monsoon. And brought a soaking wet bill to, and hung it on the front door. Thanks. And, is this, and then, so they, they come at the same time? Like, do they come on the same date every month? or? I don't know. I mean, they, they come monthly. I, I really don't pay attention to when they come, and the bill gets here, I pay it. But I'm like, really, man? Really? We literally have one more day of rain, and then it's going to stop. Look, it was raining so bad today, I saw nothing but nonstop wrecks. I mean, I had to get some stuff done, because I, I am actually headed to Aruba uh, after we get done uh, uh, taping this episode. Uh I saw one woman, this chick got sideways like four times, took out a, a a fire hydrant, went into a ditch, out of the other side of the ditch, across a fence, oh my God. busted her windshield, and, and of you, course you I stopped. I was, I was driving behind her. I was, oh she was going gosh. faster than I was. And uh, she goes, Fly, and, and you know, of course I got off the phone with the person I was talking to, hands free. Uh and I and I was actually talking to a mortician of all people. I said, I'm going to need, I'm going to check if you've got a new customer. Oh my gosh, that's terrible. So I go and she's already put it back in drive trying to get out of the ditch. And I'm like, are you okay? She's like, yeah, but I, you know, she keeps trying to hit the gas and I'm like, sweetie, you're in a ditch. I said, are you medically okay? She goes, yeah, I think I'm fine. I said, you're going to need a wrecker. I said, you can't take a car out of a four foot ditch just by hitting the gas. Uh, she then hurry to get somewhere or something. I have no idea. I, I didn't get that far into it. I made sure that she was okay. Didn't need to render aid or anything. And this is a road that would not be conducive to me. Just putting a rope around a car and pulling her out. She, she really did a wrecker. Uh, then five minutes down the road, there was like a four vehicle accident with paramedics on the side of side of the road, putting somebody on a stretcher. Like a backboard. I mean, Georgia. Ah, Georgia's not known for having great drivers. No, unfortunately not. And um, I was at. A, I had to go to a Brooklet candidate forum, and I was coming from Kingsland, which is in Camden County, which is two hours away, and it rained like what you're talking about all the way down there and all the way back, and. I mean, I will admit I'm a fast driver. Like, I don't, I hate going slow. I hate just chugging along in the right lane. But I left early both directions because I knew 
that people were going to be driving crazy and not aware of, like, I don't understand. So, well, don't yeah, understand. also vehicle maintenance is key. When, when your tires start to, the, the, the tread gets a little shallow, I replace them. Because I don't want to be in a ditch. I know that sounds kind of, you know, elitist, like, huh, I just bought new tires. No, it just but really, like a, a man thing to do. <laughs> that is true. My wife did drive around with, like, windshield wipers, because she only works, like, five minutes away. Windshield wipers that were just smearing, and I got into her car to drive it somewhere. And I got home, like, what the hell is the matter with you? AutoZone will do it for free. She says, that's your job. Nice. <laughs> she's not wrong. No, she's not wrong. Uh, as this episode drops and we're recording early, so anything that you hear that doesn't sound topical, uh, we're drop, we're, we're cutting it early so that I can go on vacation because I've been told I'm not allowed to record on vacation. Uh, it is Veterans Day, so we want to wish everybody, every veteran out there a happy Veterans Day. And it is the appropriate holiday to say uh, happy Veterans Day or, or thank you for your service. Memorial Day is not the appropriate day to do that. Uh, veterans get November 11th. And it's a celebration. Yes, absolutely. Where Memorial Day is a rem- remembrance of those who didn't make it back. Yes. So we have a update. We I do. Wish we had, I wish we had some like awesome like update music, but we don't have the budget. <laughs> uh, we don't have a budget. <laughs> 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 That's the underlying problem. No. So we, right before Halloween, the Halloween episode, I think it was 88 that dropped, um, or the Halloween week episode, excuse me. We talked about the Butts County Sheriff who, bless his heart, he, I, I didn't realize this when we talked about it, but the suit was actually for what happened last year. They weren't trying to get an injunction for 2019 they were suing the sheriff based on 2018 um when he went around and had his deputies put the signs in his yard or in their yards that said um tr- no trick-or-treating pedophile lives here or whatever they said so the judge a federal judge ruled um about a week ago that that violated their constitutional rights and he granted an injunction Um, But it was interesting because he didn't blanket say you can't do that. He was specific on these three, but then he kind of advised um, Sheriff Long that basically, like, you can't just, because someone's a sex offender, you can't just put these signs out there. Like, there's got to be an underlying danger, maybe. I don't know. He just, he was, he issued a warning, I guess you could say. And then... I thought that it was really interesting that, because there wasn't more, obviously, since there was a ruling, we're getting more information about the case. Initially, we just knew that it was filed and that it was going to be heard and all this stuff. But they wanted damages, and the judge said no damages. But the underlying premise of the, the suit was that two of the men in the case lived with their parents, and one of the men lived with his daughter, and... Their argument was, you know, you're not just punishing me, you're punishing and humiliating and causing harassment for the people that I live with or that live with me. And um, the judge actually, it was Judge Mark Treadwell, he actually said that it ran afoul of the First Amendment. Well, and all the things that we covered before, which was, if this was part of the original sentence... That's one thing, but that's, they've done their time. You can't continue to, to put the scarlet letter on them after, after they've done their time. And that's, I think is what, is what Treadwell said essentially is there, there's no continuing sentence to put this, put this sign in the yard every Halloween or hell every day for that matter. <clears throat> so it's, it is a interesting follow up. I I would think that the the lack of damages is probably appropriate because I don't know if there's any financial damages, but the injunction is is pretty solid. 
Yeah, I agree. I mean, they're all still gainfully employed. Um, you know, and I'm sorry, I misquoted the signs, and I think it's important to, to be accurate with those, but it said, warning, exclamation point, um, no trick-or-treat at this address, exclamation, exclamation. So, you know, I don't agree that there were damages. I mean, the information is public information. It's on the internet. It's it's at the sheriff's office. It's, it is places. So it's not a secret that these people are sex offenders, but are they, you know, we had an interesting conversation about it um, on in a Facebook thread about whether or not it should be included in the sentencing guideline or the conditions of sentencing. And because already a lot of, a lot of them are rounded up and taken to the courthouse or the jail or a rec center where they're locked in a room for the evening on Halloween. And, you know, us being the reasonable people that we are can acknowledge, like, why are they only dangerous one night a year, but they're okay to be doing as they please the rest of the nights? Um, that's not so much it for me as it is. I, I, I don't agree with putting the signs in the sentencing conditions, mostly because not every sex offender is interested in children. Um, but if, if, if it's going to be a thing, that's the way to do it, I guess. Well, right. And of course, pedophilia is a very specific thing. Uh, and to lump all sex offenders together, it's very, very specific. And, 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 there, and I agree, there's no cure for it. In a perfect world, you just walk over to them, shoot them in the back of the head and be done with it. But, you know, we're kind of getting, you know, that that argument kind of gets gets everybody lost in the weeds of whether, you know, we should put signs on some of these houses and not others. If they're deemed acceptable risk to be released in society, there's nothing you can do. They're, they're going to be around people and, and sometimes children. But I can't imagine being that, that I would say it was his four-year-old daughter. Six, and yeah. Six-year-old's daughter. She can read. Yeah, six is old enough to understand. And then have a, uh, the sheriff put a sign in, in daddy's yard telling kids they have to stay away. And I have no idea what the guy did. There's no backstory on what his what his conviction was about. But that she has to go to her, her bus stop every day humi- humiliated for the rest mm-hmm. of the year. Uh, yeah, that's, I mean, that's... That's a punishment to her for being she's being punished for the crimes of her father. Yeah, totally. And a, so anyway, I know we beat that beat that uh, that horse two weeks ago, and and again we brought the story up a year ago when they first started doing this, and that this is the final conclusion to the story we covered a year ago. It's not the final conclusion. The sheriff said he's going to fight it. That's true. He's going to lose. He will, and but I did. I mean. He wants to be able to put him in the right away, um, since he's not allowed to put him on private property, which I guess is something he's going to have to work out with the local and the county, because that's that is a totally different. Um, that would be a new lawsuit, because this was about on their property. But I did respect. He did say, you know, we're not going to put the signs out while while any type of appeal or suit is pending, because I respect the judge's order. So I can at least appreciate that. Well, but my right of way, I pay taxes on. Oh, I'm not. I. Uh, oh no, yeah, I know that's a different conversation to have. You're, you're talking about the the legal difference between putting it in the right of way and putting it next to their door. Right. It. You know. I. I guess I, I can credit the guy with with trying to take care of kids, either that or he's trying to get reelected. Because the easiest way to get reelected as a sheriff is to point the finger at the bad guys and say, I'm keeping you safe from them. Not everybody can have an awesome sheriff like we do in Paulding County. Didn't he endorse Casey Cagle? I don't know if he did or not. He did. Did he? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I have no idea. But, and, he, and he's wrong. He, and he's, he was wrong on, <laughs> on, he was wrong on the marijuana. But he is really, really good in this community. On the marijuana? On the mar- on the medical marijuana bill, because the no, the know. sheriffs, the marijuana's yeah, I, God, I sound old. All of our sheriffs are killing us just about on the on the marijuana. Uh, on the marijuana, so it's like Giles, the Google machine, right? Uh, on the marijuana oils. Yeah, I mean, 
But we have that's foreshadowing because we have more to cover on that. We do. But first, but not yet. The Supreme <laughs> the Supreme Court of Georgia, uh, a ruling that will cost to Cab County schools and therefore taxpayers more than a quarter billion dollars. And I love this the way you put this link. How very to cab of you. Well, they always end up taking the most expensive route. It doesn't matter what it's about. It doesn't matter who's in charge. You look at DeKalb and, I mean, they've got to be printing, laundering, rewashing, reusing, all kinds. I mean, they got to be. I don't know how they have have any left after uh, after Vernon Jones was there. Oh, Vernon. (laughs) 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 He called me fake news and. Oh, Vernon, because I told, I told the world that he said my yoga pants were too tight or whatever. Were they? <laughs> no! <laughs> I might close that bit. Thank you. I have never seen your yoga pants. I don't know. No. he No, his comment, it wasn't that they were too tight. He was saying that he liked the way they fit. And, it, and I... <laughs> okay. All right. Look here. That goes to, that goes to my creepy guy doctrine. Mm-hmm. There are certain guys, not me, that could say anything. Mm-hmm. And it's funny and it's it's flirty and it's and it, it's taken as a joke or whatever. And there are certain guys, more like me, that could say something like that and end up with a restraining order. Okay, but the thing is, is this was our first introduction at the gym in Atlanta. And I just kind of like said thanks and tried to move on and like focus on what I was doing and he kept talking and so he asked me what I do and I was like I'm a political writer (laughs) because when he said his name was Vernon someone had told me that was Vernon Jones and so I'd seen him at the gym I knew who he was and obviously that was when or this was when all of the stuff was in the headlines about him but um when I said I was a political writer that pretty much summed up the conversation because he'd already told me like made the comment about my pants. But anyway, how very like, cab of you. <laughs> <laughs> Please, <such> a... <laughs> so, DeKalb County School District uh, could owe current and former employees more than $250 million for breaching a contract by abruptly ending annual contributions to a supplemental retirement fund. So, retirement and pension funds are such a sticky issue. So I don't want to get lost in the weeds of the actual details of the fund because I don't really think that matters. My big, when, when, when you read that, because that's like the first sentence and it's in the description of the summary for the um, Supreme Court or the, and the appellee, all of that, it's all, that's what's lead, leading into it. And you read that and you're like, how did you think you could do that? Like, you, you signed contracts with these people, guaranteeing them something. Right. And, and as I recall, they were guaranteed two years notice. Right. Two years. And, and that's not, in the grand scheme of things, especially in government, that's two years long. is a blink of the eye. So had they just upheld their end of the contract and given two years notice, not, hey, uh, By the way, uh, spring break is going to be the first week of April. Uh, We're going to get out the first week of May, and your retirement's changed. Have a good year, everybody. Right. It was very bold. Um, And they cited a budget shortfall, which I think everyone was in that position at that time. I mean, the state was doing all the austerity cuts, and uh, things were tough, but... Um, I, isn't a cab the one that had the the young lady assaulted in the bathroom by a transgender what, little boy in the bathroom that we covered when we had uh, Alice and Feliciano on the show? Maybe I, I'm a, I am almost sure that was the cab also that continued to sit to uh, that sent defects to this poor woman's house. On Christmas. Hmm. I am al- almost certain it was DeCab. Because, again, it goes back to the so DeCab of you. Well, and 
it what's what is co- so crazy about this is um, pensions and retirement plans get such a bad rap for being unsustainable and um, just nobody likes them. Yet it's something that they try to save everywhere. Look at the state with the teachers' retirement system, and look at the. Um, I mean, there's counties down here where I live where they had pension plans from a long time ago that the new employees have a different benefits plan, but the old ones are still getting that benefit and still having that fed by the county because it was so important and they, they're they upholding their end of the deal. But, I mean, it's like one of the things that it's like a that would be the last thing they would cut. Well, here's the deal is, I say here's the deal. You made a bargain and you said, we're going to ask you to go to college and we're going to ask you to take pay that's beneath what other often uh, college gra- uh, uh, graduate school grads make. But on the other end, we're going to, you know, this is going to be your deal. Even if you work for a Fortune 500 company, there's a, there is a, a, a break and say, look, you know, if you're hired after this date, there's no pension. But the people that we've made guarantees to, we have to be good to our word. And apparently DeKalb County doesn't think that's that's the case. Well, and also, I mean, I don't mean this the way that it's going to come out, but what's the big deal? It's government. It's too big to fail. They could get more money from a million different places. Like, have you ever seen a, a, a government actually not have the money it needs to do something? Actually, yeah, I was in the uh, in banking when Lumpkin County uh, had their executive run off out of the country, and we had to go and bail them out. All the banks had to get together and bail them out. You're killing my vibe right now. <laughs> <laughs> and that was no. That is like a totally different situation than what I'm talking about. Two, year it was 2000, I think, and I was the I was the market banker in Lumpkin County. Yeah, well, I was 12, so. <laughs> Dave's old. It I'm sucks. talking about. Yeah, I'm talking about in 2008, 2009, 2010 when things were tough. Like, y- you didn't actually see like people kept moving, things kept rolling, and they probably robbed Peter to pay Paul. And I don't support that, but I'm just saying like, what was really at risk by doing what they've done now? Now, and that's what's so obnoxious about all of this. They're like, oh, DeKalb County owes 250 million dollars. No, it doesn't. The taxpayers do. Yeah, unless all of that is covered by insurance, and I guarantee you that it was not. (laughs) Well, and and to your point is, during the the tough times, during the Great Recession, uh, pay raises were frozen. A lot of things happened within government in order to make ends meet, but they continued to keep up their obligations. And the... And again, if you want to change teacher retirement going forward, that's that's your prerogative going forward. But you have to be an organization of your word. If you said, this is what we're going to do, and we're going to give you two years notice. And, it, I, and I guarantee you their fear was, if we give you two years notice, they're going to have two years to apply to other school districts to leave DeKalb. Because why the hell would you stay? Sure. I mean, that's... Like I said, that's the primary reason. I say primary reason to be a teacher. That's that's not true. Most teachers I know really do care about the kids, but that's why you spend yeah a hundred grand benefit. Yeah, hundred grand getting an education to make to to not make a huge living is is the benefits. One more reason for having private schools is schools can recruit the best teachers by offering the best competitive compensation and retirement plans. Totally different subject. But, you know, if you're in DeKalb County and you start seeing your uh, your tax, your property taxes go up, guess why? A quarter billion isn't that easy to absorb. Ugh. Ugh. <laughs> it, it's just, I mean, this is, there's nothing else you can say. It was a stupid decision. And I understand that whoever made the decision doesn't have $250 million, but I wish that they had to do something because it's not right. It's not right that, I mean, that's what's so annoying. And it's, this is a much smaller scale, so I don't mean to equate the two, but the premise is the same. Like with the Butts County thing, 
the taxpayers are funding the bill for him to now challenge this decision of the sex offenders and the, or the judge in favor of the sex offenders. So the taxpayers have to pay for that. Oh, yeah. And, and, and we, we cover this with a lot of our stories. There was another one where Chris Carr was coming to back up one of the local governments. And uh, the the case out here with the sexual harassment accusation by, uh, by one of the employees in the DA's office, well, he's retaining a private firm on taxpayer, taxpayer dime. These people get to play fast and loose with our money. And when they lose, go, well, right. my bad. I mean, the rest of us don't sue or don't file claims for certain reasons because it's expensive to do so and we might not win because our case is in a slam dunk. So we don't. Like, that's how you keep litigiousness at a minimum. Right. And the government doesn't have to worry about that. And 95, at least 95% of the time, that's it's not for good reason. Or for any reason that is in the interest of the taxpayers. So now the taxpayers had to pay for all the legal fees to defend DeCab. And now DeCab taxpayers have to pay DeCab. Well, it's sort of like the Georgia town that Eric's from building a hundred fifty thousand dollar sixty two foot high chicken in a t- town of Fitzgerald. This town has 10,000 people at last census. 10,000 total residents. They're going to drop a buck 50 building a chicken. Yeah, it's not it's not their money. They don't care. Obviously. But yeah, that doesn't have anything to do with, with uh, litigation. Just you talking about spending the taxpayer money made me think about the giant chicken <laughs> in Eric's hometown, and I blame him for it. Well, and I'm, it's kind of disappointing. I know it's going to be like a big to-do, but we already have a big chicken in Georgia. We do, but this one's taller. But, okay, and so... May, and made with, with private funds versus versus the one in Marietta, which was made by Kentucky Fried Chicken. You mean the one in Fitzgerald's made by public funds? The public, yes. Not public. Well, public. Right. But, okay. But... I understand, but I mean, how many big chickens do we need in our state? Well, this is going to be a topiary and may have an observation deck on top. And the mayor says it's going to bring people into this town. It's in the middle of nowhere. I don't I mean, care if it's made out of cookies. How many big chickens do we need in one state? Uh, 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 cookies? I, I, mean, may, like maybe, I mean, maybe it was like, you know, biscuits and gravy. Ew. <laughs> Ew. And how would you even do that? Because all of that gravy would make your biscuits soggy and you'd constantly be having to add more biscuits to keep the chicken up to the right height. This was such a smart show before I came on it. <laughs> how would you build a chicken out of biscuits? It's and there's the... your title, guys. How would you build a chicken out of biscuits? All right. Six months after, speaking of wanting munchies. Six months after Governor Brian Kemp signed a law allowing companies to grow and sell medical marijuana in Georgia for the first time, the program remained stalled because he and other top politicians have not appointed members of a commission to oversee the expansion. Bill 324 gave the seven-member commission vast oversight over the state's medical marijuana operation, including picking which businesses can grow the plant and developing the licensing requirements that retailers must meet to sell it. And if you if you remember, we were we made news. This made news. I mean, this was uh, Michael Gravely's bill, uh, and he was really the the champion of get, getting this bill through and did not le- allow the legislature to drop it. So it's well, law. We just can't do it. Well, right. And I think that that was a lot of people's contention with the commission because it was another level of government required by a level of government that has been resistant to this. But my thing is, is, Jeff Duncan tried to kill this, and he was almost successful. And Brian Kemp 
saved it. So why did he do that if he wasn't going to allow it to be implemented? So he can smile at both sides. So he could go to... Well, that's unprincipled. Yeah, so we can go to j Wages, who was a champion of this bill, who has a uh, severely disabled daughter, who, uh, Sydney, who was pictured with, with the governor, and this medication has absolutely saved her life. Uh, went from, from almost it, uh, a life that's just, just incompatible with moving around at all with constant seizures to having a life. And it, and he put her out front, and he was, and he opened up his family to to the, to Georgia and the world. Uh, he was the inspiration behind it. Where a lot of these politicians were, no, 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 pot's bad. And he's like, come to my house and come talk to me, come come and be around Sydney and see the difference. And Governor Kemp had the Wages family around him had Micah standing behind him and he signed this into bill and has uh, and this bill into law and has done nothing to enact it. So he can go smile at both sides of his face, go to faith and freedom and go, yeah, it's law, but I, but you know, they can't do anything about it and turn around to these families and go, I did the best I could. I, I signed the legislation when they gave it to me. I said, that's exactly what I said I was doing the campaign trail and then smile at both of them. Meanwhile, these families that have children who are suffering still have no legal means of getting the medication and they have to turn themselves into drug traffickers and bring medication into the across state lines, making themselves federal criminals in order to do something in order to give life preserving medication to their children. Um, yes. And Kemp, I mean, Kemp made it a thing on the campaign trail ahead of his little face-off with Casey Cagle in the in the runoff, and I just um, the only the only logical reason would, in my opinion, and it doesn't make it right. It's just the only one that actually makes sense. Like I hear what you're saying, and I understand that he can supposedly appeal to both sides, but he's he, he did it, but nothing, he didn't gain anything from the cannabis community because they now, they no longer have what they need. The only thing I can think is that he wanted to buy some people some more time who weren't ready to do this. You know what? Here's the thing. The cannabis community is such a small vote. The true people who need it. So it was the I rest disagree. of us. That it was the rest of us that were rallying around them. It's and only a small community because the state made it a small community. Right. Well, I'm saying what I'm saying is the 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 folks that actually need it are relatively small, and as long as the rest of us think that's what's that's what's happening. What, but what's happening is Jabo Jimmy Wages. He's known locally here as Jabo. Uh, is not going to let it lie. And he's making sure that Sydney's warriors and people know that, that and that's r- where I got this story originally was him releasing the information that nothing has been done. Not s- a single member of the commission has been named. And it's not just him. It's him. Uh, who, who else is in charge? Jeff Duncan, speaker of the house, Ralston. Nobody has done anything to make a move on that front to appoint anybody to this board. Hell, I'll serve. I have no desire to own a marijuana company. You know, I've got like three hours a month I can give them. Right. So you can't say that you don't know anybody that that's qualified. It's not, it's not that difficult. Oh, the, no. No, but... I don't say that what you're saying. That's not, I'm not saying that what you're saying, but they can't come back to us and say, well, we've just been doing an, ex- an exhaustive search. We... Whew, and then Johnny Isaacson stepped down. Oh, my HR department's been just swamped. Right. I don't know. I, I, and, and maybe that's just me being impatient. I understand it just became law in July. But I would have thought by now, would you know, with Ralston saying he has so much state business, he can't go to court. 
uh, well, he's not he's not working on on the marijuana commission. No, and yeah, so it didn't take law or take effect until actually, I I think it went into effect earlier than that. I think it was one of the ones that was signed earlier. But regardless, the whole point was that we're going to get it done this year and it's going to have some procedural time and then, of course, growing time. And January 2021, there's going to be weed in Georgia for these people to buy for their oil. And that's it, every month that that go every week that that's pushed back. It doesn't, it's further away from reality for those people. Yeah, I believe it's six months from the time that you, you commence operation to, till you start harvesting. If I recall what what they're expecting, and none of it's being grown indoors, so without the license, you cannot even acquire the the real estate necessary to pop up a building to to build a grow house. And, and I assure you, we we have people right now, and, and I know a couple of them that are raring to go, that have experience in, in the area. And I'm not, I'm not talking about illegal grow operations, but people who who have worked in Colorado and California, who are were heavily invested out there, who are ready to make it happen here. They have people ready to put on staff to bring here and make that happen. And nothing. I, 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 and I don't know if they're waiting up, just waiting in line to see who's going to make the biggest donations to the 2020 campaign. I have no idea. As a reminder, these are our opinions and not necessarily those of all on Georgia. That is true. <laughs> So as I call the politicians dirty, that's me, Dave not Roberts. Jessica. Yeah, it's Dave Roberts, not Jessica, not Shady. And definitely not Stella. Yeah, 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 definitely not Stella. So Georgia has toothless ethics laws. The Coalition for Integrity recently released a report on enforcement of ethics rules by state agencies. The report analyzes how state ethics agencies exercise their enforcement and sanctioning powers and how transparent that implementation is. The report demonstrates the significant differences between in, excuse me, in state ag- agency ethics enforcement and lack of transparency in actions taken by those agencies. Georgia's ethics agencies scored poorly in enforcement efforts and transparency. So... I, first of all, realize that I start every conversation with, so, if you listen to any of these episodes in in order, like, every single one, Dave lines it up, and I'm like, so. So you take a shot every time you hear so. <laughs> That's right. You'll be drunk by the time we say, as a reminder, these are our opinions and not those of all in Georgia. But for to get on my soapbox before we really dive into this, this is... There, there are two parts of government where other levels of government can hold government accountable, and that is transparency and ethics. And I will concede all day long and twice on Sunday that it is impossible to fully legislate ethics. Like, you will always have loopholes. You will always have creative people who can find their way around it. You will always have deceptive people I mean, it's just a reality. It's a reality of government. Government is unethical. But we've talked at length about how the Attorney General's office is basically worthless when it comes to true enforcement of our state's um, Open Records and Open Meetings Act and everything. This is the this is the other side of that. This is the other side of the, the coin. They both are terrible. I think this is worse, honestly, um, because it's much more clear. But I'll, I, do you want to go over the report, or do you want me to go over the report? Go ahead. I, okay, I'll go over the report. Um, I mean, I'll tr- so, I don't trust the author on the on the on the article. Mm-hmm. I wrote the article. I feel like that's happened here on the show before. <laughs> <laughs> it's like deja vu all over again. Right. Uh, excuse me. I'm the one that wrote that. No, so the Coalition for Integrity, uh, they released this report and they said that, you know, they, the, the biggest problem I will say with the, the study is that our laws aren't the same in every, every state with regard to ethics. So it's not like you're comparing apples to apples. 
But that's not what they were really going after. That was the first dig people made at the study. But what they were looking at was, you know, how are you enforcing your state? What kind of transparency and ethics laws do you have? Are you enforcing them? Are they enforceable? And, you know, what is the punishment for violating one of these? And is it does it go with like, just the legislative branch, just the executive agencies? How far does it go? So, I mean, they do the best they can. It's not a perfect study, but I do think it gives a good indication. Did you say we got, did you tell them we got a 39 no, we got a 39 out of a out of 100. <laughs> we got a 39. Which... Like, and it's totally true. We got a 39. We're in the bottom 10. Um, we got dinged on the Government Transparency and Campaign Finance Commissions. First, we, we should get dinged on that name. It used to be the State Ethics Commission. Why do we have to change it to that? But we got dinged on their jurisdiction because their jurisdiction is only for financial disclosure. And we also, I mean, this wasn't in the... Um, the report, but we, our legislature used to have it, the law so that even the local officials had to report to the state and they don't do that anymore. Um, the locals report to the local board of elections and just and, the state. And, and, and if, and if you're in Paulding County, you have to go and get a paper copy because it's not available online. Uh, that doesn't surprise me. I mean, a lot of them are like that. It, it, it's in, and, and then it's not published online. Like that was the beauty of the state ethics website as clunky and as ugly and as slow and as hard to navigate as it is. You could still eventually find the reports online and view them. If you want to go find these, you got to drive down there, ask for a copy, um, pay for the copy and go on your way. And it's bad on both sides. Uh, Dan Bowles, when he ran for uh, uh, county commission out here and is a computer guy was trying to navigate this website and get his disclosures. I mean, he procrastinated, but it got to be 11 o'clock at night and he's hitting send, 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 send. I guess he got up to go do something else and came back. And by the time it sent, it was, I don't know, 1230 or whatever. He actually get the website to accept it. Again, this is a computer literate guy. And of course, when the uh, MJD got him, the Marietta, or MDJ, Marietta Daily Journal got him, they, they, you know, nailed him for 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 you know getting his disclosures in late but it's the fact that the the site now truthfully he procrastinated but he he was within the legal limits and i asked him i said so damn what did it cost you he was a bad article which is sometimes worse than the financials depending on where you live and what it is and what you got going on but oh yeah and, that, and that's the thing is it would have been far easier to pay a, a a fine of a couple hundred bucks like you know it was 30 minutes late. Here's 200 bucks. I'm sorry. Well, it's um, funny you say that because in 2018, the commission, so in, this, in the report, they found that our commission found five violations of the financial disclosure reporting requirements and issued fines totaling $750. That's because the first fine is only 125 then I think it's 250 and then it just goes up from there. And if you don't pay your fines, you know, they accumulate or they... I don't know if they double or what, but they, they do increase. So in 2018, they only found five violations. Now, I'm not saying that they should go around to our elected officials and just run up a tab because I don't want to see them paying their tabs with campaign dollars or state dollars or whatever. But at the same time, we can all agree that they're... But in 2018, when we had all those elections, all those primaries, all those write-in candidates, all those third-party candidates, state governor... Um, like the entire legislature, and they only came up with five violations in all four reporting periods, plus all the two-day windows. Give me a freaking break. And the other thing is, as you know, and and you've worked on campaigns too, there's no clear thing when you go onto the site to do your disclosure. There's there's not a check mark to say, this is the position I'm running for, and then it populates with what information is required. So... If, if you've got somebody who's a little too open, he exposes way too much of his personal information that's not required for that particular office. Or it, it, it's so ambiguous that if if you're, and of course this is an incumbent protection thing, I, I, I believe, is if you're a new person, if you're a layman to politics and you don't know exactly what the position you're running for is supposed to disclose, 
you're shady. Or if you expose too much, then, then you know, you're really giving personal information out that's not required for this office. So the, the website is fairly laborious to, to navigate, especially if you're somebody who just wants to do the good, do the right thing by the, your potential constituents. There's, there's, unless you hire a campaign professional, which is not cheap, especially if you're running a grassroots campaign, right. you don't know exactly what to fill out. And, and I'm just not, not saying this is the, 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 the fault of, of the ethics commission, but let me tell you something. If I go to open a, a business account online, if I go to the secretary of state website, I, the, the good example, separate secretary of state website, I say, what industry am I, am I in? Construction, drop down, trade, drop down, HVAC, drop down, commercial. And, and I can populate all those, those fields and it comes up with exactly how much I'm supposed to pay to maintain my license, exactly what the education requirements are as you, as you populate those fields. It almost seems purposely obtuse to, to no. leave these, these processes in place that are so difficult on anybody that doesn't have the $20,000 it costs to bring in a, a professional campaign manager. Well, and the other, com- the other side of that is that, you know, the ones that are fined, whether it's on purpose or the, like it was a deliberate thing or um, it was an accident. And I have been the cause of an accident on one. And it wasn't, I mean, it was after, ironically, it was only a couple years ago. Like it's after I'd done it several times and then I still made a mistake and I had to, I, I took the blame publicly and in the newspaper and everything like I was willing because I did it I messed up I didn't understand but um the the there's no so the person that I work for was honest and they just paid the $125 fine there are legislators who have retired or died and still haven't paid their dang fines and there's nobody doing anything about it so why even bother and if you all remember Mr. John Oxendine, our former insurance commissioner, who had all kinds of ethics claims against him and has staffers and witnesses and just bounds, mounds and mounds of evidence. And it's been 10 years. And they say that he used campaign money for his house, for cars, for daycares, for daycare, dare, my goodness, daycare services. Um, I've infected you with with my with my speech. Yeah, I can't speak, but I mean, athletic club memberships. He lives in a nine hundred sixty five thousand dollars house. Supposedly, the down payment was used for that campaign funds, all of it, and he did it under the guise of a loan. Now, I'm not going to get into like whether or not what he did was right, but the fact is, is he's been under investigation for ten years. What's the point? He Is there something about that job? I, I well, I think it's about some like Republicans in that job, but yeah. I mean, is there something about that job? This is also the guy that had his red light taken away from him. Well, For... there's something about a lot of these jobs because the ethics staffers or the ethics directors, the ethics commission directors have had their slew of problems too. The last one had to leave because he was allegedly watching porn at work. I mean, that's why there were only three or five fines in 2018 because he was well, busy, it, I guess. But Isn't it his job to watch people getting screwed? Ha. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if I didn't see that one coming down the pipeline, I don't know what I wouldn't see, but I, that was predictable, Dave. You're yeah. better than that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> really not. Uh, but, you know, we got Oxendine, who's been under, under investigation for a decade. We've got our suspended current uh, insurance commissioner under investigation by the feds. You have Ralph Hudgens, who endorsed Jim Beck, who is our, I guess, immediate past insurance commissioner who ran the office into the ground and had to have governor deal bail out his office because he 
didn't have any money, which goes back to the previous discussion about how when you don't have any money, like money just appears and everything works out because you're government. But the rest of us are like, um, please may I have another little package of ramen? Never has a government sat around the kitchen table staring at a stack of bills going, how do we make this work? No, no one is sitting at City Hall going, if we don't make this payment, we're going to lose City Hall. Uh, my mailman actually made an op- observation. I was talking to him the other day. It really, it's really smart and wise guy. Um, he said, "Look around the county, and tell me if you see any old vehicles with the county uh, with the county sticker on them." And damn if I can't unsee that. Everywhere I go, I see brand new trucks. And, uh, and they don't, obviously, and then they raise my taxes, and they don't have to worry about making ends meet. Yeah, government has no no accountability. It's one of the reasons that I believe that that tax day, April 15th, is on the exact opposite end of the calendar as the first Tuesday in November. Sure. And and going back to this report, like another one of their complaints was that we don't, Georgia doesn't publish an entire report. If they sanction someone or find somebody, they will put that on the website and you can search it by their name and that's all fine and well, but they don't publish a report at the end of the year that says, you know, we had this many complaints and we had, cause they take complaints too, but we had this many complaints. We had this many investigations. We sanctioned this, this number of people, you know, this was the, the collections. This was, this is heaven forbid. This was our revenue and our expenditures. And this has how much we spend on investigations. There's nothing like that. Like how much is transparency, ethics, and corruption costing the state of Georgia? Georgia doesn't have anything to compare year to year to see if we're doing better or worse. Um, and that's, I think where we got hit the hardest on the score, but we totally earned that 33. And and, and I think that's, that's something that we can recover from, especially with the, the strides that that Kemp made since he came into office with referring, uh, uh, complaints to the IG instead of heads of departments. You know, if, if we were to take that similar. Okay. Okay. Hold on. I'm going to agree with you because we talked about that on the show. But if you go to the invest inspector general's website for the state of Georgia, the last case that was put on there was June with that juvenile the Department of Juvenile Justice little husband and wife car scam thing. We we um car wash maybe, I don't know. We we've covered it on the show. That was the last one. You're telling me that in 5 months nobody else has had a complaint or a grievance or any type of thing handled? Well, and I have no idea. Now the answer is no. Well, I don't need to hear. I don't need to see every open investigation because no. That, but I'd like to see the closed ones. I would like to see the closed ones. Uh, so I guess it's, it is. It is November. It's not, you know, I I keep thinking like in my mind it's still August. Like oh, that was only a couple of months ago. No, it's half a year ago now. That's half a year. You're right. I know you know this, but you're right. Well, yeah. I mean, who's suppressed? <laughs> <laughs> Me. I mean, you get a couple right a week, I know. Me. Uh, do you think the legislature's to blame? I mean, do we need to pass yes. some laws? Well, Ooh. so I don't think they even, they don't have to pass laws to, to get this. The legislature has the authority to say, could you produce this report for us? I mean... And have it ready for us on November 15th every year. And we'll talk about it January 15th every year. You know, they can. Um, within, their, within their oversight. Yeah. Or purview. the governor can. Or, I mean, because he appoints the director. You could, if somebody really wanted to be transparent, this information would be out there. Because there is somebody in government who can run these, can take the information that the ethics commission keeps and turn that into statistics. And I guess the best branch uh, about this is the judicial. As we discussed last week with being called before the carpet and publicly uh, uh, disciplined. Right. uh, With the judges. And and I know it doesn't happen enough, but how much would you love to see someone who screws up called before the well? 
are called called before a committee and be read for filth and and, and put the put that out. I mean that's I I, I guess I, I guess as a gawker, I think that would be uh, that would be fun. But what really needs to happen is there needs to be some some fines with some sting to them. And what would be nice is to speak of passing laws to say that ethics fines may not be paid with campaign funds. And I, I guarantee you start seeing some people toeing the lines when they have to write their own checks. Right. You know, well, I... It's just... Send someone in to, to do something. Like, don't allow them to collect any more donations until they pay their fine. Well, it... We're expecting government to police government, and that's the problem. Right. It's by design. All right. So I've got my Alex Jones tenfold hat on. Jessica, do you have any closing thoughts? I'm worried that if I channel my closing thoughts, it might interfere with your tenfold hat. <laughs> Are you stealing I'll my thoughts? I'll let you have it. I'll let you, yeah, I'll let you have it. I, I just saw a, a trailer for, and it's rare that I, that I see a movie. I'm like, that's, that's probably pretty good. But uh, Tom Hanks is going to play Fred Rogers and uh, uh, kind of do the story behind him, who he was a Methodist uh, preacher, uh, loved kids. And it should be, a, it, especially with Tom Hanks' uh, 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 talent, should be pretty good. Fred Rogers is also Mr. Rogers. You don't say. And no, he was not a Green Beret. No, he was not awarded uh, a bunch of medals for killing people. He was just a nice guy who was a Methodist preacher. And who I grew up on. Mm-hmm. Along with Howdy Doody and who, whoever else, because I'm old. Tough time. <laughs> All right. Did you watch Howdy Doody? No. Good God, Jessica. Well, I mean, you made a point to bring it's it It's the up. oldest thing I could think of. Hmm. I'm 10 years older than you are. I think you're more than that, aren't you? Uh, maybe 11. How old are you? 42. Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> I got you by a decade. Uh... Well, if you guys enjoyed the podcast, or if you didn't, Rate us five stars or four, if that's the maximum. Uh, share us and like us on social media. Uh, interact with us. Send uh, send commentary to us. We we really we certainly appreciate the constructive criticism and and anything that you like. We'll try to do again. Except when you say Dave, be funny because that happens once every ten episodes. So, for Jessica Salaji, I'm Dave Roberts. Have a great week. <laughs>